We have an exciting lineup this morning, um, but before we get there, I just want to thank the Connecticut Coalition and Homelessness, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, the Supportive Housing Works, and the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness for being uh, partners in planning this event. I also want to thank the wonderful staff here at the partnership, whose efforts are really what make these events such an incredible success. And I should thank the uh, sponsors of our entire iForum series, uh, Bank of America, the Connecticut Association of Realtors, the Department of Economic and Community Development, the Department of Housing, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, Webster Bank, Wells Fargo Bank, the Melville Charitable Trust, People's United Community Foundation, and TV Charitable Foundation. As many of you know, um, Reaching Home is a state campaign for preventing and ending homelessness, which is uh, staffed by the partnership and driving opening doors to Medicaid, which is really a collaborative initiative um, focused on guiding and supporting state government, philanthropy, advocates, providers, and communities, um, and formulating and implementing strategies to prevent and end homelessness. The whole purpose of this effort is to foster change that will really lead to deep impacts so that homelessness is um, brief, rare, and non-recurring. And we, many in this room know that that's really no small order. Um, many people who are chronic and homeless experience high rates of mental illness, substance abuse, and chronic health conditions. We are honored to have Barbara Field, Laura Dellinger, and Nadine Mata here in Connecticut today. I have the pleasure of introducing Barbara Field, um, has been with the regional administrator since April 2011. Uh, as a presidential appointee, Barbara represents the Obama administration and the HUD secretary in the six states of New England and serves as liaison to mayors, state and local officials, members of Congress, private and nonprofit developers, public housing authorities, and other stakeholders. Her work at HUD has focused on cross programmatic efforts, including HUD's innovative sustainable communities and choice neighborhoods initiatives. She's one of 10 regional administra administrators in the United States. Barbara served for 20 years as the executive director of the Island, Island Office of LIST, the local initiative support corporation. While at LIST, she managed nearly $300 million in real estate and programmatic investments and developed a track record of successfully linking affordable housing development with strategic community, economic development, education, and public safety initiatives. So please join me in welcoming Barbara Beals. I am a familiar face as I do try and cover the states and get out. And uh, Laura, we are region one in the HUD regions for a reason. Number one, because we are doing some creative and innovative things across the region. First of all, here in Connecticut, and congratulations, Alicia, as you stepped into this interim role for the work you're doing. The Partnership for Sustainable Communities is one of the, the strong communities, uh, aligned with our sustainable communities, is one of the first places I visited. Um, Howard and David very welcome you to me, and I know that you'll continue that work with us as we move forward. Everything in Connecticut for me is led by the best news I have to announce is just last week, Suzanne Piacentini has become our field director. So um, we are really thrilled about that. Congratulations, Suzanne. She steps into this role with incredible uh, working knowledge of, of everything going on here in Connecticut. But um, I know that uh, I know you're happy for her. You'll warmly welcome her um, into that role, as long with our other head colleagues that are here from our other divisions. Because homelessness for us is all hands on deck. Do be a partner with all of you, and we welcome that opportunity. It's a tough budget time, but the other second good piece of news is that the homeless programs in the HUD budget is the one thing that has not only hold, held its own in these difficult times, but has really increased. And the Secretary has made this a number one priority to prevent and end homelessness so we are going to Congress and saying, we need the resources to continue the programs, to do more with the programs, and you'll also you'll see in the budget an additional ten, um, uh, budget allowing for VASH vouchers. We want to do 10,000 more vouchers around the, the country. I know there are folks from the VA here, another one of our federal partners. A lot of the work done at HUD is aligned with the USICH, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, a 19 uh, federal agencies involved in the opening doors, really groundbreaking and historic effort to prevent and end homelessness. They have a rotating leadership, and this year Secretary Donovan is the chair. 
So I was particularly excited when he named Laura Zeilinger to step in to be the new director. She follows uh, closely with Barbara Poppy. They work hand in hand, but Laura brings her own wealth of experience to this position. So I am glad to have her back in New England. I told her we had her in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts. We're gonna get her into all the states of New England, but I'm glad that she has come to join for this forum and to the great panel that's coming after because she brings her experience from the District of Columbia working in the Department of Human Services, her passion for this work. I just asked her if she has rollers on the bottom of her shoes in this new job, because her job is to be out around the country. We're thrilled to work with Bob Polster. We know he has other regions, but we just keep telling him he's got region one. But thank you, uh, Laura, for the work that we do with Bob. We're thrilled to have you here in Connecticut. There's so much going on. I'm here to learn together with you, but we welcome you, we welcome your leadership, and we look forward to continuing to work together because Connecticut, I believe, was the first state to put out its plan to prevent and end homelessness. My home state, Rhode Island, was just behind, but as I said, it's a competition we want all the states to win. We want to continue to make big strides, and this winter has driven this message home to all of us even more as we have all been very cold, particularly thinking each night as I tuck my children into bed, how fortunate, how blessed I am, and everybody deserves to have a place to put their head at night. So thank you, Laura, for the efforts you're doing to continue to give a voice to this nationally. Welcome here to Hartford this morning. Laura Zeidler. Thank you for such a warm introduction. It's great to be here in Connecticut and really such a warm welcome even on a very cold morning. Um, thanks, Alicia Woodsby, um, and the Partnership for Strong Communities, and the I Forum for organizing this important event and really allowing me to participate with you in it. Um, I hope that some of what I share with you today will be helpful and something that you can use in the great work that you're doing here. Um, we have lots of, you know, the, the number of people in the room and the different organizations and places they represent are really a true testament to the kind of collaboration you have here in Connecticut, which in the uh, really innovative work that you're doing. You have staff from um, Governor's Office, Governor Malloy, and the Lieutenant Governor Wyman, state and city officials, housing agencies, hospitals, faith groups, community organizations, nonprofits, um, as well as my federal colleagues from HUD and VA. Uh, it's a terrific group and I'm so glad that uh, you've come together for this conversation. I'd also um, like to recognize Bob Polster, who Barbara already introduced, and Richard Cho, a native Connecticuter, and also a member of our policy team at the council. Um, both uh, individuals with just unbelievable commitment, passion, and tireless work devoted to this issue, and they're part of the team and in partnership with you and really getting this work done to end chronic homelessness and homelessness among veterans and for all populations in our country. Uh, this is my second week on the job <laughs> at the council. Um, I don't really get to claim, you know, the excuse of being new uh, since I've been at the council for about three years now. Um, but, it, but certainly new in the position, and during my second week, I am so pleased to be able to be here. Um, this, this is exactly um, the, the, the reason why I do this work, is uh, to be in partnership with folks like you. Uh, being in Connecticut, I'll have to tell you, feels especially significant to me. I've always wanted to come and be here because when I first started working on homelessness in the District of Columbia, really knowing absolutely nothing about it um, as part of our my mayor's staff and team on health and human services, I went to a sort of community meeting not dissimilar to this. It was a gathering um, that was hosted by a group that um, can be not-for-profit housing developers. And we had some someone from the Corporation for Supportive Housing do a really in-depth presentation on the innovative work happening in Connecticut to combine affordable housing with supportive services. And I'll tell you that that presentation just really was eye-opening for me, and it was really uh, inspired a lot of progress uh, that happened afterwards in the District of Columbia. 
So I'm aware that Connecticut is often referred to as the land of steady habits. But in my small world of homeless policy, you've always seemed to me like the land of early adopters. It's not just peer states and communities that have taken notice of some of the innovative things going on here, um, but some of the evidence-based solutions seated here and in other forward-thinking jurisdictions are really being noticed by the Obama administration. This administration has been really focused, and it's really the underlying theme in the president's budget this year, on learning what's working, and identifying <coughs> evidence-based solutions, and really finding the ways that government can incentivize and encourage the, their broad implementation. So one of the most powerful ways the federal government can do this, of course, is through the budgeting process. Uh, Barbara mentioned some of the highlights in the budget, and I'm going to just go over a few because I want you to realize that um, the president's fiscal year 15 budget proposal, his request to Congress, uh, is this, uh, you guys hear me, I feel like my microphone's going in and out. Um, it fully funds the implementation of opening the doors. And, and, and I know you know because you have Opening Doors Connecticut that the vision that underlies opening doors is that everyone has a safe and stable place to call home. And it, we, um, and it divides our goals into population goals and the budget includes the resources that are needed to end homelessness among veterans and their families to end chronic homelessness, and to sustain and advance some of the vital programs and progress we're making for families and youth experiencing homelessness. Some of the key things that are new investments in the budget or increases that are important to this are, um, as Barbara mentioned, the 10,000 additional HUD vouchers nationally, an increase in the supportive services for veterans and their families program, SSBF, from 300 to $500 million, and a $301 million increase in HUD's homeless assistance grants. That is funding that would create 37,000 new units of permanent supportive housing nationally. So if Congress funds this budget with these resources, we can achieve our goals here in Connecticut and nationally, but really only if we stay committed to their strategic deployment and implementation. We've got to use these funds on the things that we know work, which does require change, right? It's not just about new money. Connecticut, probably much more than many other places in the country, is well positioned to do this. You've got your state leadership really focused on ending homelessness. Just a few weeks ago, um, <coughs> your governor in a state, state address committed to ending homelessness among veterans by the end of 2015, in line with our national goal. Your state has a active interagency council on homelessness in a new department of housing, making significant commitments to affordable housing, recognizing that it really takes different people in the room, not just your targeted homeless programs, but your mainstream systems, and those partnerships is the foundation for getting done what needs to happen. Senator Chris Murphy last week urged his colleagues to join him in support of the historic new investments in the president's budget. He told Congress, our goal should be to make periods of homelessness rare, safe, and quickly resolved. And I'll just kind of share with you, um, as an aside, I'm going to um, be off script a little bit, that we've spent a lot of time messaging what does it mean to end homelessness. And because when oftentimes when we talk about ending homelessness, people sort of roll their eyes and think that uh, it is uh, this is an intractable problem. It's not something that we're going to solve. There will always be this problem, and we really need to explain what it is we mean. And I've never heard it told as simply as periods of homelessness are rare, meaning that we prevent them whenever we can, and when they happen, we're able. People are safe in a safe place and they're resolved quickly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that. Um, in any case, what would it take to achieve that in Connecticut? Secretary Shinseki uh, from Veterans Affairs, had, whenever he talks about the issue of homelessness, talks about the importance of data. He says, I cannot solve a problem that I cannot see. So let's look a little bit at your data, just for a minute. You probably know this well, but sometimes it helps for a couple of times. In the last um, official 
HUD data is from your 13.10 count. We haven't seen what your 14 numbers are. And in that count, you throughout the state, there were 4,448 people experiencing homelessness at a point in time. Of those 919 were in shelter, that's 21%. You counted 3,089 individuals that were homeless last year, and one out of three of those individuals were chronically homeless. 129 of the individuals who were experiencing homelessness were veterans. So 129 veterans who fit the chronic homeless definition with 341 veterans in all. Sometimes breaking down those numbers helps put your arms around what do we need to solve this problem. It sizes it in a way that um, quite honestly, you know, is quite manageable. Coming from working in the District of Columbia, um, which is a much smaller jurisdiction, um, our numbers there were, were um, much larger, in some cases more than twice, what you have here. Um, so this is a problem that with the resources and the intellect and the innovations and the will and the partnerships that you have in Connecticut, there is no doubt in my mind that you can solve it. You've adopted opening doors as your state plan. It's, it's the right plan, I'll tell you it works. Um, and you've invested in the expansion of permanent supportive housing, increasing your units by 28% since 2010. So there are efforts in Connecticut that you can build up that merit being brought to scale. And you may have efforts underway here that warrant an honest conversation about whether or not they're working in line with your goals on homelessness. Those are important conversations to have too. With the perspective of someone from the outside looking in, I'll urge you to stay focused on three important things, and the rest of my remarks are really going to talk about these three things. One, prioritize the resources that you have for people with the most acute needs and remove the barriers that, people, that are imposed to accessing those resources. Keep investing in state resources and really leverage the, your mainstream and non-targeted homeless programs uh, toward this, the interventions and the services that you need. And finally, manage to your goals. You've got a plan. You've got a great strategies in your plan. You, uh, work toward those goals. So starting with prioritizing resources for those most in need. This is absolutely critical. Doing so logically requires an understanding of those who are experiencing homelessness in your community. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but sometimes it's just helpful to sort of break it down. So there are a number of paths to get there. One is through a coordinated entry system. This is a process I understand is starting in many places and you gotta move forward to implement it. There's an opportunity to implement it statewide. You have a statewide HMIS, which provides a very strong foundation for that. And having a coordinated entry system is such an important part of your infrastructure, not just in chronic homelessness, but for all populations, to really begin to understand what is going on with people who are also experiencing housing crisis and connecting them with the range of things in a person-centered way as opposed to a program-centered way to make to make to really meet the need. So it's real, so it's and it's got two benefits. One is that your that people have to who who are in a crisis or not or left or not having to navigate independently multiple doors on their own to try to get their needs met, which we really, you know really doesn't work and is not always realistic for people based on the situation that they're experiencing. But also allows you to optimize your resources. It's efficient because then it's not about who knows the right person to call to get somebody into an empty bed? And where is there a bed that can serve this program, serve this person, which is a program-centered way? It allows you to really be person-centered. Um, so I know that's your intention, and it's critical. And the faster that you do this, um, the, the more efficient you will become. The second path, and these aren't alternate paths, these are parallel paths, is through prioritizations through your data. So you're already doing some incredible work here with your data, with your FUSE initiative. Really look, matching person level data between multiple systems to identify those people who are generating a lot of costs cycling through 
homeless programs, jails, hospitals. There, you've been an innovator in this and, and used it as a way to identify and prioritize people and by looking outreach with housing and also through your social innovation fund pilots. Most jurisdictions have tremendous difficulty in negotiating their data sharing agreements to do this and you guys make it look easy. So it's another way to sort of keep doing that um, and do it bigger. So it's, and I'll stop and just say, it's easy to get caught up in the process. I've seen that where, where, where I work and, and in many places arguing about which is the right assessment tool, trying to get everybody on board with exactly how we're going to do it and what is our process going to be, um, or in, in, in how we're going to capture our data in different fields so that we can match it, and all of those things that just sort of are a lot of effort spent, sometimes not always solving the problem. So when this happens, if you don't remember anything else I'll say, just remember this. Stop, look up, and remember the common interest that everybody has, which is really the people who we're trying to help. So with the data, the numbers, 21% of people in this state who are unsheltered, they're not just a percent or a number, they're, they're individuals. So, and when we know them, and, and all these systems are just ways to help us know them differently, we begin to remember that this individual here, his name is Jake. He's on a bench. He's, we always see him on that bench under that same series of gray blankets. He is 72 years old. He's lost two fingers to frostbite. He served in Vietnam. He also has diabetes and some form of cancer. <coughs> Understanding those things about the individual helps drive urgency, and it also opens up resources that are available to help. I'm gonna come back to that point. But I'll just say that knowing the complex situations then paves the way for rethinking first come, first serve, multiple wait lists driven approaches to solving the problem in favor of collectively identifying and prioritizing people with the highest need and highest level of vulnerability for housing. Looking at your data on your supportive housing inventory, right now you've got about 60% that's targeted for people experiencing chronic homelessness. So you're in a position to bring more people <coughs> to the street and safety and into safety through relentlessly targeting these resources. And I encourage you to make an intentional decision about this as to whether statewide you will prioritize people experiencing chronic homelessness with the highest levels of vulnerability for all of your supportive housing units that turn over. It's a decision you can make, or it's a decision if you don't make, it probably won't happen. So be intentional about it. What is it that you want to do? Where are you? What, you're, you're at 60 now, how far are you gonna go? The way to effectively prioritize entry to permanent support housing, and, you, and I would imagine you all know this, but I will just say it because it's important, is through Housing First. What that means is we're, there are not barriers to entry into the programs. So I think about it two ways. One is that housing is therapeutic in itself. It is the foundation in which you can provide health care intervention services from that can be effective. Without that stability, all of those things of housing, those things just don't work. If the eligibility criteria that are in place keep the people out of the housing who actually really most need it, then your programs aren't working for you. And they're not, they're not working for your efforts on homelessness, and they're certainly not working for the individuals who are vulnerable in the community. So getting to zero in Connecticut depends on operating housing first, not only across all your permanent supportive housing programs, but really across all of the interventions that you have. They all of, so it's thinking about housing first, not just in a, we have this housing first program over here and this one over here, but how do we do it system wide? To help you with this, we have a checklist. It's a, we just boiled it down to very simple questions to ask about your programs and to ask about your system. Uh, so I encourage you to use it. The communities that are implementing Housing First across their systems are making the most progress on chronic homelessness. New Orleans decreased chronic homelessness by 85% since 2010. Phoenix, in their adoption of Housing First, has seen a 47% decrease in chronic homelessness, and they have ended chronic homelessness among their veterans. 
Same is true in Salt Lake City. Across the country, adoption housing first isn't something that's just based on an ideological debate about how, between housing first and housing readiness. It's practical, right? It's guided by successful outcomes of situations and, and learning about what's working in other places. So getting to so in it, so the the next so I'm gonna go back. So the first thing I asked you to think about was prioritization, and the second is about how you're leveraging mainstream resources. We know that we're not gonna to get to zero through homeless programs alone. We need to leverage community and mainstream resources to get the job done. This is a centerpiece of opening doors. It's really premised on the fact that all of those resources need to come into play because solutions to homelessness are not just about homeless programs or even only about housing, but about access to health care and employment and um, in, in a range of other services. One way to do this, though, on the housing side is to think about your voucher program. To what degree are your housing choice vouchers accessible to people who experience homelessness? Are you connecting people with Social Security and Medicaid? So it goes back to Jake, right? Our 72-year-old veterans living on the street. Understanding those characteristics also helps you think about what are the resources that you have available to you. For example, people over 60 may, might be prioritized for senior housing or for money follows the person pilot, um, which allows you to bring in your Medicaid resources to pay for services. If it's someone's a veteran, or this is in a mainstream program, they could be prioritized and served in the HUD BASH program. Understanding the characteristics that people have helps us understand the resources that we have that can serve them that are not just there because that person we, un we identify them because they were experiencing homelessness, but because of all of the other conditions that people experience. And, um, you know, it feels a little bit embarrassing to say this, but there is pretty much a government program out there that has, was designed to address one characteristic or another that, that any individual might experience, right? So it's how do we make those resources work in a seamless way for people, it's really that coordination and why those interagency partnerships are so important. That's how we're gonna create the efficiencies. So I'll give you a couple numbers to just think about. We have $2 billion, we're funding the highest level ever and has targeted homeless assistance grants. Compare that to the voucher program, which is about at $23 billion. And federal spending on Medicaid at $300 billion. So the math makes sense. So you can be a leader in this area, and you are in many ways, um, in paving the way for other states. Your, your FUSE initiative, your social innovation fund work is targeting homeless individuals or high utilizers, utilizers of Medicaid. Uh, this is important. Keep doing this. Your social innovation fund demonstration is really helping build a prototype for how to create permanent supportive housing by coupling Medicaid and housing. The big potential here is showing how ending chronic homelessness is a strategy for Medicaid cost containment. And finally, the Medicaid Institute for Supportive Housing Agencies, uh, you've started to collaboratively approach Medicaid policy and benefit design and provider capacity building. That combination of benefit design and building provider capacity is exactly what is needed, and we're so excited to see you doing this. It can be a model for the rest of the country and folks are, paying, are, are taking notice. So I, I describe it for a reason, in my mind, is, is not just steady habits, but early adapters. You're, uh, you're also still revolutionary in that way, and I encourage you to keep doing this, but take it to scale. We know what we know about revolutions, right? Broad supports needed, alignment around goals is necessary, and leadership in managing to those goals. So you have broad support and alignment on your goals here. You have your plan, opening doors, Connecticut. You have your governor's commitments that we're going to end homelessness among veterans here in 2015. What you need to do is to set benchmarks. What are you doing, not just in the long run, in the next year, in the next two years, but what are we doing in the next 30 days? What do we need to do in the next 90 days to get there? 
and really hold yourselves accountable. I will tell you because we have an analogous plan at the federal level, we do that. We meet around our data, but we also have milestones of what are the things we need to do to really get to our goals. And then we hold ourselves accountable by showing that data and, um, and, and really being accountable to one another on whether or not we're staying focused on things we need to do. And I encourage you to really think about are you doing this here fully to the degree to which you could be or could something like that really help you stay focused. So that's a lot. And, um, and I thank you for all of your attention and listening to it. I hope that it's helpful. Certainly, ending chronic homelessness and homelessness among veterans here in Connecticut is possible and it is really within your grasp. Thank you for the work that you do, coming together in partnership, working hard every day, doing things that many people do not believe is possible and proving that it is because that inspires hope and it, inspires, and it provides momentum to go even, even further. We're your partner here in Connecticut, and we are so pleased to work with you until everyone has a safe and stable place to call home. We will get to zero. Navigate 
those multiple systems and the multiple eligibility processes and forms until they have somebody all the way through their process. And that for them has been one of the things that they point to in Phoenix is game changing. Um, it is really also an example of where that community-wide buy-in on the goal and partnership with philanthropy to fill in some of those places where there just aren't enough sometimes government resources for the kind of things that are needed, like in the outreach space, to um, to really ensure you know, that there's that level of intensity and service to help somebody through that process. In New Orleans, they have uh, used a vulnerability index survey. They have been really 100% um, of their permanent supportive housing is targeted to people with the highest level of vulnerability, <coughs> people who are chronically homeless there. So while they, you know, they've also had an infusion of resources post Katrina, but before Katrina, you know, but because of Katrina, they also had a huge increase in the number of people who are experiencing homelessness. So I'm not sure that, um, you know, it's they can say it's because of the resources that they've been able to only to have that decrease because of just a huge amount of need um, that is still there because of uh, because of the hurricane. But in any case, I think that they have, they have strong partnerships. Um, they're doing really extensive outreach there, and they are they are unwavering in the way that they prioritize. Hi, I'm Preston Maynard from the VA in Connecticut. Welcome. You know, Connecticut has got some urban centers, but we have lots of rural places. And I just wondered if you could comment about you know, uh, transportation, which continues to be a big barrier here. You know, the best transport, the transportation that happens for most homeless people in a rural area is their most local police officer picking them up and driving them to a shelter in the urban community. Are there any good models of kind of rural places organizing around helping to get to zero? So I do not have a model that comes to mind in a rural place, which is, we will work on that and see if there's one that we can identify that would be helpful. Um, I'll note that the Department of Transportation did put out some resources um, in partnership with the VA to try to address some of the, the transportation needs that you talked about. Um, so that would be something to look to uh, in case it could be deployed to be helpful. Um, it is really, what I've, what I've seen and learned from people about the way that they're approaching homelessness in rural settings, it is really through the, the partners on the ground, so really being able to empower faith organizations and the folks who, are, who really are in those places that, so that people don't have to always travel to be able to deliver services. That's why the SSBF program for veterans in particular has been so helpful because it can be, it doesn't, it's not located just where the VA medical centers are, but it can, it's, it can be deployed by community organizations where you can bring the services to people instead of expecting people to always travel to the services. So it's really, I think, through those partnerships that, are, that we can be really effective transportation is an, is really a huge unmet need among all populations, and we, uh, you know, it's something we are where we go, and we'll continue to do the things that we can do to try to address it. Um, but we'll also work on some models and, and try to put some things out for rural communities. It's a space where uh, we don't have any examples to share in a concrete way. chooses homelessness when they have other viable options that meet their needs. 
So some people may not want to go into a shelter and they're opting out of the shelter system to be outside, or they may, or the housing or things that are available to them come with conditions that they don't want to participate in, or they may personally just not have, be in a place yet that they're, that they're ready, that they, that they want to accept offers that are in front of them. But I have never seen anybody who, over time, has not accepted an offer to come into housing. And it really is, your second question, I think really points to the fundamental issue of trust. It is really about building a relationship with an individual and understanding what's going on with them. So um, I know we're just about out of time, but I'm gonna share a story with you um, to help you understand why I really believe this. When I worked in DC, there was a gentleman. He um, had a, he lived outside, uh, not far from Union Station, hugely visible um, setup he had going on. His home was a, like three shopping carts full of stuff and just really central on Capitol Hill. Um, and I, I was working for the city and our city administrator, who's sort of our, you know, our number two, or sort of deputy mayor person who um, lived on the next block. And so whether or not we were being successful with all of the work we were doing on homelessness, I think in his head was really whether this guy ever ended up getting off the street. Um, he believed that he was on that corner because he was under orders from the Secret Service to be there. And that he could not stand, he was a veteran, and he was not going to stand down until he had orders that told him that, that it was okay. He believed that he had dated Princess Di as well, and he had a number, he had, he had a whole, you know, a whole reality of things that were going on. So there were, and he knew he was very friendly, everybody in the neighborhood knew him by name, and I mean, he was really, and, and folks really helped him a lot, which was, you know, good and a human thing to do, but also really was sort of enabling to um, help him be comfortable on his corner. We had every, I think just, I can't tell you the number of folks who really tried to engage um, this individual, and eventually um, a, a friend uh, who worked for, you know, with me, Human Services, a guy named Dallas, who there wasn't anybody that he could not build a trusting relationship with. Um, you know, was successful. We got him an apartment that overlooked his corner um, on Capitol Hill. We negotiated how, and this is a pretty high rent neighborhood, I will tell you that. Um, we, we, uh, we negotiated to, to, because it was like not good for, not good for business, not good for the neighborhood, right? To, the, that like, this was going on there. So it started, he, when we first got the apartment, he was still sometimes outside. His favorite beverage was cherry coke. We stacked his fridge with cherry cokes in there. You know, he'd first come in, take, take showers, have a coke, and he eventually ended up in that place. He did not when um, when he was when when he first got the apartment. Um, Dallas said, "You know, you want me to help you move your stuff?" And he's like, "I'm not bringing that stuff into this." <laughs> 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 before he came in, but he came in. So, it's, you know, I think it's just about persistence and really about, you know, meeting folks where they're at and making an impression. So sorry for the very long story. At the end, I think it just helps remind us what, what it is we're, what we're about. So thanks so much for your time. And well, now we have the distinct pleasure of introducing Nadine Mata. Nadine is the president and founding board member of the Rapid Results Institute. He led teams that introduced the Rapid Results approach in Nicaragua, Kenya, Madagascar, Ghana, Sudan, Rwanda, and Zimbabwe, among others. Um, he joined Schaefer Consulting in 1990 and he became managing partner of the firm in 2009. He continues to work with leadership teams in major corporations on driving change and accelerating strategy execution. His work has been featured in the New York Times and in other publication, and he, publications. And he was named by the Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 global thinkers in 2012. He was also selected as Yale School of Management Donaldson Fellow for 2012 and 2013. He was born and raised in Lebanon, and before joining Schaefer Consulting, he worked as the U.S. Agency of International Development in Peru. In, uh, 
for the oversaw the implementation of USED's relief and rehabilitation program during the Lebanese Civil War. He also worked for Save the Children Federation, where he led the design and implementation of a food assistance program that benefited 100,000 families that were displaced by the Civil War in Lebanon. There's much more that I could say about the team, but I'm sure that you'd much rather hear from him directly. So please join me in welcoming the team. Thank you very much, Alicia. And it, it's an honor to be here and an honor to speak after my good friend and colleague, Dora. Um, so first, I shall mention this, uh, this global thinker thing. Uh, I, um, I did uh, protest the foreign policy magazine, but all of my work has been about helping accelerate results. And then I get this thing about a global thinker. I said, I've been telling people less thinking, more doing. <laughs> and, uh, so I wish they had an award for a global doer. I would much prefer, prefer that piece. But, but I, nonetheless, it was an honor to receive that. And, uh, very appreciated. And I think, um, Alicia, the the bio must have been a slightly old one because uh, probably the thing that's most relevant for the group here is the work that I've been doing in the past couple of years uh, with a number of you, certainly with, uh, with USICH, Laura and Bob, on accelerating the pace of housing in chronic homelessness and veteran homelessness. And that's really what uh, I'd be focused on. But I do want to say first that um, as a disclaimer, I am not an expert in the field. I think it takes more than two years worth of work to become an expert in the sector. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is less on the technical issues that are extremely important, you know, data, housing first, all the strategies, and focus more on the change management aspects of this work that I've been introducing or helping to introduce into, into the sector. And, um, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm okay. I think I can do it. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> Appreciate the food. Um, so, um, as Alicia mentioned, my experience in change management was all in developing countries, uh, mostly sub Saharan Africa, issues ranging from education in Sudan to family planning in, uh, in Madagascar uh, to HIV AIDS prevention in Eritrea. Uh, all using this way of working that we call the rapid results approach. Uh, so I want to start by like how I got connected into the sector. Uh, because that wasn't really obvious at all that I'd be talking with you all experts in the sector after the background of that time. And then this, so I want to tell you sort of my personal story in this. And uh, Alicia told me that somebody at some point would tell me I have five more minutes. Let's stop it because once my story starts, I can carry it away. Um, so where this all started and, and what I owe the privilege really of working uh, in this sector has been to uh, uh, a young woman that some of you may know, Becky Canis, uh, the director of the 100,000 Homes campaign and the founder of the 100,000 Homes campaign. And it's interesting when you mentioned in my bio that I worked on 100,000 displaced families in Lebanon with the food assistance program. This is the first time I'm making a connection between, you know, when I was a practically a teenager in Lebanon and the Thousand Homes campaign. The connection was as follows. Um, we were lucky, really, that the New York Times picked up on our work in Africa and um, they wrote a big feature with several stories, including one on a village in Sudan called Taruba and a place called South Cordoba. Uh, where uh, we introduced this work and the community team decided as uh, sort of their challenge, their 100 day challenge, to build the school uh, and to increase the enrollment, not enrollment, I'm sorry, the attendance in the school by 30% within 100 days. And I just give you an idea about sort of what we're talking about. This picture here is actually the school of Taruba that the community had. And a hundred days later, the local community, this is not us, this is not sort of money coming from the outside, this is not expertise coming, it's a group of people who took on that challenge along with other groups in our villages, 
they increased the attendance by 30%. This is the school that emerged 100 days later. So Becky was really impressed when she saw these the two pictures side by side in the New York Times. She, um, she sent me an email saying, Nadine, uh, I, you don't know me, but I read this thing in the New York Times. And uh, this thing you guys do in Africa in 100 days, we really need it here to work on homelessness issues. Um, and uh, so that sort of was the start of the journey um, into, this, into this sector. Um, now, interestingly, you know, after several conversations, I mean, I wasn't sure first, you know, what, who she was, whether this is serious, etc. A few conversations later, Becky said, listen, you're, you know, you're in New Haven, uh, you go to DC very open for your work, so why don't you head down to DC, meet a friend of mine, uh, and you guys can sit together with other friends in a conference room and uh, give me a call I'm in, in LA and let's see if we can do something together. So I headed down to DC to meet Becky's friend. I don't know if I got the sequence right here. I'm going to skip this. And here is Becky's friend that I met. You can, it's hard to see to see her. She was maybe like two years younger. This is Laura Zeidinger. <laughs> none, other, none other than Laura Zeidinger. She's actually standing on a table. That's not how I met her, by the way. This is, this is later, this is a picture from the archives. Um, she's standing on a table, sticking a marshmallow on top of a tower of spaghetti. And don't ask me what, you know, Laura and USICH is doing. We, 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 actually, we can talk about that later. So that was sort of the, the first face-to-face -face meeting with anybody in the homelessness work. Again, it wasn't Laura on the table. Actually, it was Laura and a couple of colleagues in the conference room. And we talked about what we want to create together. And I think we, we created something we're going to talk about called the Rapid Results Boot Camps uh, that uh, we're very excited about. I hope that some of you will be excited about that as well. And uh, really, this was a collective effort with a lot of partners. So another individual I want to highlight in this story is a young woman called Beth Sander. I don't know if anybody has met her. She works in another Thousand Tones campaign. And here she is here in another compromising position <laughs> with three tennis boards on top of her head. Um, and by the way, both of these pictures are from the Rapid Results Boot Camps that we ended up doing later on. And uh, really, the other players have been some remarkable people in uh, federal agencies, uh, people like uh, Mark Johnston from, from HUD, Lori Rosen uh, from the VA, Lisa Pay, Nancy Campbell, uh, some of them left the VA, uh, Caitlin Miller, who's also not with me. So to, truly, I'm, uh, it's been such a privilege and honor to work with, with, with this group of people to create this thing that we would like to talk about, uh, that, you know, this rapid results boot camp. So, okay? so, Here's the, uh, the first iteration on the work that we did in 2012. What you're missing on the top, it says Rapid Results Bootcamps. The initial focus we did in, so in this design that we created was to focus on HUD Bash, on accelerating the use of HUD Bash vouchers and increasing the targeting of HUD Bash to the county owners. And so we, in 2012, we did this work with about and in communities around the country. And the way the work played out is we would ask teams from six, sometimes five, sometimes seven communities to come together in a room for two days. The teams would represent several uh, agencies and, and local, organizations, local organizations. And after immersing themselves in the data and in the issues, they actually on the second day, decide collectively in each community, by each team, to commit themselves to a 100-day goal related to either the acceleration or the targeting or both, and then develop an initial plan to achieve that. And then we sort of lightly accompany them for 100 days, uh, meaning that every couple of weeks there'll be a call between the team leaders and some of what we call the coaches that are part of this process. Um, every month, there is a call that involves uh, federal partners that actually, you know, uh, 
listen and see how they can support these teams. Uh, so there's a process that they follow for 100 days, and at the end of the 100 days, they come together for uh, something we call the sustainability review, where these same teams present to each other and to federal partners what they achieved, what they learned, what support they need, uh, and then reset the goals for the next 100 days. And so the first iteration in 2012 was focused on Hub Bash, and um, some communities, and I think New Orleans would be one of them, reduced tremendously the, or increased the chronic, the, the targeting of chronic quite by, I don't have the numbers right over the top of my head, but pretty significant and dramatic improvements. And then we upped the ante in 2013 and created, and these are the cities that participated in the boot camps that we did collectively with the campaign and with the federal partners. Um, there were six of these boot camps, each involved seven, maybe eight cities. In total, I think we were working with 44 or 45 communities. Again, same idea, six or seven in a room. In this case, it was actually two and a half days. And the focus was a bit broader in 2013. So instead of Hadvash, we said one group of cities would focus on the placement rate of veteran uh, of, of homeless veterans, and the other group, the other group of cities would focus actually on the uh, placement rate of the chronic individuals, chronically homeless individuals in the community. So it, was, it, it, so it was the whole system, but in one case focused on veterans, and the other is focused on the chronically homeless, including the veterans, yeah, chronic veterans as well. Uh, in the aggregate, with the the 2013 boot camps, uh, the average increase in the third month of placement, the placement rate in the third month of the, of the work was 125% what the average had been. So it was more than double what they started with. And in fact, interestingly, the chronically homeless or the, the, the boot camps focus on chronic homelessness if you just take these, which is about half of the, the cities, the rate was almost tripled. So in 100 days, they tripled the placement rate of the chronic homeless in their communities. It wasn't quite tripled, it was, I think, 187%. Um, now, again, don't want to make claims that we cannot substantiate on you know, how was that sustained at that level after the third month and forever. No, in, in most cases, after that bump in the third month, things went slightly down and stabilized. So they overshot in that third month, but they stabilized not quite at that high rate, but at a remarkably higher rate than what where they started with. I've got a couple, couple of examples on this. This actually is New Orleans. So you can see the, and, and this is a, a, a veteran uh, rapid results bootcamp, and there, the starting average was 30 per month. And you can see they, the first month, they were at 40, second month at 38, the third month, the model month, was at 61. So double the rate, and importantly, pre boot camp 15% chronic, post boot camp, the chronic, you can't see the number here, I guess it would be uh, 30, uh, 46%, so from 15 to 46, tripling the rate of how many were housed at work on. This is the new um, In Nashville, this is actually, uh, I think uh, uh, somebody asked a question about uh, street outreach, and Laura talked about knowing people by name. Uh, this is Will Connolly, the, the team leader of the Rapid Results team in Nashville. Again, it's very dark, you can't see, but he's doing an assessment and getting to know somebody on the street, chronically homeless individual using a tool that has you now gaining more and more currency in the sector, I understand, it's called the VIs for that. Um, and uh, he's the Will Connolly, by the way, of the 60 Minutes fame uh, that went on in the 100 days that followed their team, went from a baseline of about 20 to the third month actually was 58, the goal was 67, but they 
they stick to 58 in the third month, triple the rate of chronic complaints in national. So uh, really, uh, I think, potentially very impressive outcomes. Uh, so before we talk about the, uh, what, was, what went into that, let me just sort of you know, summarize the, the, the impact that was created. You know, in the initial 2012 work, it was how fast they were processing the, the vouchers, the targeting to chronic, and in 2013, the placement rate. But what I think we don't talk enough about actually in this work is what happens to the culture of the environment and the communities in which they work. So how does that affect how they work together, which I think is as important as the actual numbers and the actual results. Now, um, I want to pause for a minute and um, talk about why it, it might feel, maybe it feels like easy to cite these numbers, but in reality, these types of performance lifts that are so dramatic are actually quite a bit of an anomaly. They are not easy things to happen in any sense. And so I want to see if we can demonstrate a little bit that observation in the room here. Right? So uh, I'm going to ask, you can have to indulge me with this one if that's okay. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Okay, and, and so I'm going to, um, yeah, including the folks on the balcony, yes, I can see you there, you're still sitting. You gotta stand up. So um, I'm gonna mention three scenarios, okay? Situations. And if one of these situations applies to you, I'd like you to sit down. If none applies, please stay standing, okay? So, um, first scenario, I remember these and I'll bring them back up, is uh, you have been going on and off to the doctor and uh, you know, the last checkup they said, you know, you really need to start a regular exercise program. In fact, maybe your spouse even commented on that. <laughs> and you feel like, really, I do need that, you know, half an hour walk every three days is critical. I'm going to start doing this. You, you know, make that commitment to yourself. You actually, the first week, the second week, you hold on to it. The third week, things begin to slip, and you know, we're back to normal. Don't sit down yet, okay? Uh, the, second, the second scenario is you hear a little noise in the car and uh, you feel maybe this is the break. Uh, so uh, I better take this to the garage. Uh, then um, you, know, you, you say to yourself, tomorrow morning when I take to the garage, etc. etc. Uh, you, you know, a week later, it's not in the garage, you hear the noise again, you make that same commitment to yourself, and a month later that noise is still there, kind of waiting to happen. That's the second scenario. Third scenario is uh, you have your iPhone, and we're all very excited about our devices, and you realize that you're just checking the iPhone just one time too often. Maybe every five minutes I need to check what emails are coming. So this is not very productive. I'm gonna start, as of next week, just checking my iPhone you know, every two hours instead of every five minutes. And again, I mean, the first week you actually do it, the second week, maybe a bit less. The third week, we're back to normal. If one of these three scenarios applies, please sit down. <laughs> All three of you can sit down as well. But we need some people to stay standing here. That's your <laughs> so we don't want to get the, the, the state that where everybody's seated from the first, um, you know, from the first menu here. So, so let's. Let's do another quick three here. You can probably guess ahead when you see these. So the first one is that, you know, again, similar issue with the exercise, but this time the, the doctor's order are to stop eating. Please stop sweets, period. And uh, again, you make that commitment, etc. And then, uh, you know, you're, you know, you're walking around and the dessert tray comes around and you find yourself unable to deliver. That's the first scenario. Uh, second is we're all workaholics, but you made a commitment to your family that on Sunday I'm not going to actually 
you know, check email, you don't do any work. The first two Sundays you live up to it, and then it slips away. And then the third is that course you wanted to take, that, you know, just to improve on your you know, professional prospects. And it's been month after month that you say that, you commit to it, it never happens. One of these three applies. If it does, sit down. If it doesn't, um, oh my god, we have a virtuous person in the house. Can we give her a round of applause? Just so you know, I was going to spare you the third, the third wave, which I wouldn't have wanted anybody to sit down on these. So, <laughs> so yeah. the one more dream. I have my own vices, but they just None of these. <laughs> so, uh, the point I want to make here is that these are really, really important commitments. Right? In health, safety, you know, professional development, three issues, and yet we make these commitments and we don't follow through. Um, you know, there's something going on here that we should be aware of. Okay? And, and there's probably many reasons for this. We can, I mean, I'd love to talk with you about your thoughts on this. If there's one or two ideas somebody wants to offer, we'd love to hear it. But, and then I give you sort of my own interpretation of that. Anybody would like to offer why we are flawed in this way? I know you're about to say something. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> yes. The nervous system is essentially conservative. Yeah. Doing the same thing. It's interesting. So the nervous system <laughs> may have something to do with it. And you know, in fact, it's it's at least one one of the reasons. There's probably many. Is that um, our rational brain has this fantasy that if we plan things and decide on that, somehow that's going to lead to actual behavior and the right decisions. And the reality is that you know, what happens in the moment when these choices are presented itself, you know, present themselves have less to do with the decisions we made rationally and sometimes more to do with all kinds of other things. Things that may be, you know, in front of us, things that are urgent that we have to do, uh, the temptation to succumb to, you know, desires we may have, whether they be sitting down and watching TV instead of taking that walk, or other things that maybe, you know, are more, more viceful, so to speak. <laughs> so we have this fantasy that somehow our rational brain controls our decisions and our behaviors. And, you know, some behavior economists actually call this the amygdala hijack, meaning this, this part of the brain that we share with the, with the, with the reptiles uh, is still directing and hijacking our decisions. And that's the amygdala that responds to the moment, the fear, the, you know, the tiger is in front of us, are we gonna plan ahead or are we gonna run? Obviously we're gonna, we're gonna run, that's the amygdala making the decisions for us. I want to think around here because there may be helpful professionals who, who are going to correct me on this. And you know, in fact, some would actually say that we're schizophrenic, that the frontal lobe of our brain that plans and thinks ahead is always in conflict with the amygdala at any point in time. And chances are the amygdala is going to win over in the moment. So let's start by accepting that we are all, to some degree or another, flawed, except for one of us in this room. <laughs> And in fact, I don't know if you can make this out here, but uh, that's another example of you know, how we have the great intentions. And, uh, so imagine now our flawed beings are now combined with other flawed beings in organizations that are trying to make joint commitments. Etc. So, and, and there it gets even more complicated. So, let me share with you some of the stuff that happens when we combine people in organizations. You know, one is, you know, how we respond to recognition. Okay, I'm empathizing, by the way, with uh, this movie here. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, are we going to really be motivated if we feel that way? But that's how you know it's often many people feel in organizations. 
Another one is bureaucracy. So uh, let me see if I, this is longer to read here. You know, imagine the, these folks um, being affected. <laughs> so under new business, they're calling for help. Peter wants to know what action, if any, he should take. So I have to pass through the whole chain of command before making decisions. And I mean, this is not far from home because sometimes we're talking about people on the street that need help. And of course, the third one that my favorite one organizations is about like the idea of empowerment. <laughs> <laughs> so we're up against a lot when it comes, I mean, these all exacerbate the flows that we're talking about. And now, even more complicated in your sector, because nothing happens by one organization alone in your sector. You can have multiple organizations come together and do things together, and then you might end up with this. I mean, Connecticut might be immune from this phenomenon of inter-organizational love. But uh, most other places, uh, bless you, bless you. So we, we've got, that there's a lot that we need to work on. And I'm gonna suggest that this stuff is really, and that's partly why we don't see the types of lifts in performance that we hope and expect for all the time. So that's why 10-year plans may not be enough, they're important, but they're not enough. So what we've done, or helped do really, because this is an ongoing discovery process, is to create mechanisms through these boot camps and the work around them to acknowledge these realities and actually counteract them in small ways. And I want to share with you some of the methods. And again, these are not the technical pieces. In each of these events and boot camps, we talk about housing first. The experts talk about housing first. We talk about data. Really, really critical. The question is, how do you get these things to stake? Where people actually own them, adopt them, and start doing things with them. So here are some of the methods that we've built into these boot camps at have. First is shrinking the change. You may have read uh, the, the book Switch that talks about shrinking the change. Well, that's something that we've been practicing in Rapid Results work for many years. And the idea is to go from the 10-year plan to the 100-day goal. And the 100 day goal is actually around placement rate. So this is not a goal in 100 days to develop a plan. This is a goal to actually reduce the placement, right? And so what it does is three things. Uh, one, it gives what we're working on a fighting chance against the other urgent stuff that we're up against. And we're all about, you know, up against urgent things. Second, it frees people up from the tyranny of the forever. Because now we say, well, you know what? If you guys want to co-locate the housing authority folks with the people, the caseworkers of the PA even, let's try it out for a few weeks or 100 days, see how it works. If it's helpful, we can institutionalize it. So it's not like we have to make a policy decision on this. And any number of ideas sort of see the day of light if that window is limited rather than being for uh, and um, I forgot what the third one is. Did you come back? Um, <coughs> again, the importance of, of making it feasible for people to make a commitment rather than either not being able to make a commitment or making a commitment that's largely not that meaningful. Because let's face it, I mean, when, when you have something you need to do three years from now or that you feel I need to deliver on three years from now, chances are you're not going to lose a whole lot of sleep over it in the next day or two or one week or even a few months. So that's the first piece, shrinking the change. Uh, the second piece is creating actual drama and theater as part of these events to illustrate the point. It's very hard to see this. Again, uh, uh, this is Laura, this is Lisa Bay, this is Lori Rosen. What you don't see that I was hoping you would is this little string. If you see something hanging down from his waist, a rope, there's a red rope between them. It's actually like a physical rope that when we organize these events, these national level leaders would come into 
the room, tied at the hip with a very large rope, and marching to the tune of, the, what was it, Laura, that you, you, you guys would be? Chariots of Fire. So, and they actually, and it was really to make the point, the, the point to the communities in the room, that the federal agencies are literally tied at the hip. I've got the five minute mark here. Okay, tied at the hip when it comes to this work. And that theater is really important because it creates a space in which people tend to nudge their behavior in a different way. Uh, engaging the leadership, again, here in a different way. This is Mark Johnson on, uh, as basically because of sequestration and the 100 day reviews, he couldn't, not, very few of the federal partners, we were lucky to have Bob Polster and many of these, but so we, we had to work our way around that to bring him in. Uh, but for Mark, he would actually Skype in and listen and comment. And in fact, in the monthly calls that were done with the teams, and we're talking six boot camps over 100 days each, so that's you know three calls per, per boot camp. Mark Johnson did not miss one call. Well, and, and the idea of the call isn't for Mark to say, what have you done for me? It's more, tell me what you did, Tell me what help you need from us to make it happen or to make it the next, next level. So it's really shifting the role of the federal leaders and placing the emphasis on the communities. Uh, peer support, peer competition, again, this is back to the marshmallows and the towers. Uh, these are four communities, uh, Atlanta, San Diego, uh, Denver. So they competed in the events to build these marshmallows, they competed with tennis courts, and then they competed with each other on the third month and where they were gonna be. So, it, so the Phoenix and Salt Lake City competition that Rachel Nuttall talked about on Christmas Eve, that actually, the genesis of that was in the Rapid Results Bootcamps, where they took on the challenge of beating each other to the goal line. Um, and it's not just competition. I mean, what's really interesting is people compete, but then people are so eager to learn from each other. We had a situation where somebody from the Atlanta team, literally, Regina Cannon, works in the mayor's office, followed, took a plane to follow a colleague, Marcella McGuire, from Philadelphia, to learn about what Philadelphia was doing on, I think something, again, Laura mentioned, flow which is how you take the people that are in the uh, highest intensity support uh, programs that can graduate from that and move them to lower support units and programs to free up the highest need programs for others that, that need it. Uh, and, and, and again, literally she heard about it, she couldn't get enough of it in the session itself, so she followed her to Philadelphia to learn from that. And then the last, that I want to talk about is empowering the front line. These two individuals are caseworkers in Skid Row, in some of the missions and outreach organizations in Skid Row. They're presenting at the Home for Good conference last year, uh, and I think sitting in the front row, this is Mark Johnston, this is Barbara Poppy. Actually, I'm sorry, this is Mark, and this is Barbara Poppy. They're presenting about the work they did in the 100 days prior. And they did a special type of a boot camp that focuses on, again, one of the points that Laura mentioned, coordinated entry. And what they did in Skid Row is they actually designed, and we're talking from line workers, case workers, and others that are you know, in the trenches, designed, built, and used a comprehensive, coordinated assessment, outreach, prioritization, matching, with everybody in Skid Row participating in and agreeing on policies for, you know, what's going to be the priority list, how we're going to, you know, all the policy decisions that need to be made were part of what they figured out in the 100 days, and they actually were able to put 37 people through that, chronically homeless individuals, and they moved, you know, again, we're talking just, in a, you know, they, they did a lot of housing, you know, of course, in Skid Row, but 37 going through the system, and then they moved from that and expanded it beyond Skid Row to Overall County. And that's the, the process they're in now. And in fact, that work has become sort of the evolution of what we have been involved in or what we're, we're getting involved in. 
So we kind of, this is by the way a picture of what, how they described the system before the coordinated entry and how literally it became after that. So we started with these boot camps with bash acceleration. We migrated to accelerating the housing placement for chronic and veterans. And I think the next evolution that we're excited about is housing placement acceleration while building the coordinated entry system. Because here the coordinated entry system is what sustains the process. Um, so it's not a flash in the pan, but something that can be sustained. Uh, and we're uh, actually going to launch this work in 25 cities next week, on Thursday and Friday of next week in DC. These are the cities that have been selected by the VA and from USICH uh, to introduce the you know, to take the bootcamp work to a very different level, focusing on the uh, coordinated entry and building the systems for that. I'm supposed to wrap up now. Is that, is that like a minute? <laughs> I, I do want to mention that apart from these 25 cities, we're doing this work in parallel in two places. One is in Nashville and the other is in New Haven. And I want to thank uh, Lisa for who's a, another Yale uh, alum who reached out and said, can we try this out in New Haven? So we're actually going to launch for the entry work boot camp of sorts, a mini boot camp in April with the New Haven team. And hopefully we can expand from that to the, uh, if there's interest, to the other parts of the state. And I couldn't say no to Lisa, partly because I live in Brantford. And in part. So we're uh, in part because she's such a wonderful person. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, culture, really quick. Um, what happens around these numbers is confidence that we can do this, collaboration, and really building the muscle of collaboration because that's critical, injecting trust in the system, beginning to look at this from a systemic perspective, and feeling like we're all in this together. So if you actually talk to people who have been involved in this work in the various cities, whether that's Phoenix or Salt Lake or others, you get a very different feeling for how people are interacting with, with each other. It's as if the culture is beginning to shift. This doesn't happen in a hundred days, but it begins to happen. That's the possibility that, that takes place. And I want to end with one slide that came from a presentation that the Denver team did um, in, uh, in, in the sustainability review of one of the bootcamps. This describes the one-stop shop they had and how excited they were to have nine veterans that actually left with the housing voucher in hand. And some of the comments, the collaboration has been amazing. What a great example of what can be accomplished when we all come together. And this here, which I thought was very moving, a term, I guess, a Japanese term, that says to repair with gold, the art of repairing pottery with gold or silver lacquer, and understanding that the piece is more beautiful for having been broken. And um, it just, Stay good uh, for a while. Thank you very much. certainly veterans into all of these type of veteran boot camps, and in some cases, you know, previously homeless veterans. Um, so that's one way to bring the voice in. Another way is simply the way the design of the work. And in fact, the reason we do the marshmallow tower exercise is to illustrate that you have to start with, with you know, who's at the center of this, rather than build the process and then expect the person to fit into the process. You really have to design whatever you do with the person in mind, just like Dora was saying. But I'll be honest with you, it's, um, we could have probably done more of that, uh, because what, I, what, we, what we find is when we invite one to each team, it feels like tokenism, 
and, and then we, we couldn't you know, have large groups in the room traveling to different places, so it, it wasn't quite as good as I, I would have liked it to be, but hopefully we could find more. So it's, sustainability review is intended for that purpose, to say this is not about ending in 100 days, this is about what are you going to do to sustain the results that have been achieved. So actually we design it with that in mind. And let me again put a disclaimer. It's not as if we have like a, a model <coughs> from heaven that we're in, we keep iterating and trying to figure out what makes the most sense. So, um, we have the teams actually work specifically on the changes they need to make to institutionalize whatever worked for them. So in some cases, it's doing a more use of each other. It, so whatever worked, now the question is, would that, would that live on its own, or would it require some, some additional work? So the plans post 100 days are about that additional work, but we also challenge them to reset and then some get creative, like literally in the in one of the boot camps, the hundred day goal of Salt Lake City was we're gonna make Phoenix. Enough said. So we let it also be a little bit fluid and and you know it's not gonna this isn't gonna be something that necessarily will work all the time everywhere and obviously the more the support and coaching they get, the more likely they are to, to sustain. But we try to do what we can with the constraints that we have. What tools and the evidence-based practice were used in the creation of the final model? Uh, I'm sorry, the final model is... Well, that, that, um, put here, this here. So, um, if you, like, so one, one of the key elements of coordinating anything is having common ways to look at the issue, in this case, to look at the needs, right? Uh, and that was, that's not always you know, evident in, in communities, uh, in any sector, to agree. I mean, everybody wants their own way of looking at that. Um, I'm not an expert in the sector, but what I understand is um, the, the tool, one of the tools that's out there for that purpose has been proven to be scientific. And, and that does one thing very well, which is to triage the individuals among the various interventions, whether it be rapidly housing, permanent supportive housing, or mainstream. I'm getting really good in the technical stuff, from the myself. So that, that tool that has been determined to meet these criteria for the LA work was the VIs for that. Um, I don't know what the acronym stands for, vulnerability index. And, okay? <laughs> um, but there are probably other tools out there. I think the important thing is that each community or group of people that are coordinating need to agree on each other what this tool is and need a tool that you know says or does what it says it does and, and that's being scientifically proven to do that. Is that a setup question? One last um, comment if you have one related to um, sort of the culture and the environment, how this allows for um, stakeholders to gain risk. I remember hearing you talk about this and it really struck me. It seems so logical that it would do that, but why that's a powerful and important component. So, okay. okay. I want to make sure I'm not hearing you right on this, Alicia. So, um, so, what, so what we're talking again about is, the, is, is creating a space, even if it's for 100 days, where um, you know, it's okay to experiment. And that's kind of part of the, part of the, the, the power of, you know, of moving away from let's all agree you know, through eternity on how we will do things. So the risk is mitigated in part because of the initial time horizon 
And rather than trying to convince everybody to adopt things, say, let's try things up. And this is where I think the leadership comes in. So all of these teams you know, aren't there so only because they, they just showed up one day. This work that needs to happen so that the leadership group in each community explicitly says, it is OK for you all who know what the problem is to experiment over the next 100 days. And if things don't work out, Okay. We, it, it'd be okay. So, you know, you have to engineer that, otherwise the people will tend to feel, you know, why should I take that plunge? Uh, when, if it doesn't work, it's going to reflect on, on, on my career or my organization, maybe adversely affected, affected if I, you know, if I come into the system, you know, everybody else join. So, you know, there, there's a bit of a negotiation that takes place uh, that, that enables people to take more risks than otherwise they would, because that's really necessary. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, how do you experiment if people aren't able to, you know, just try new things and, and, and feel somehow safe in doing it? Sven? How important is the engagement specialist and the peer specialist in that model? Again, the you know when it, when you say engagement specialists and peer specialists, this is on the outreach side, for example, right? Right. Peer support in that model. Like, say I'm a person that's been homeless. Yeah. Been homeless. Yeah. Been homeless. yeah. I mean, what we found, and again, this is sort of more of the technical know-how, is that the best way, particularly for veterans, to be approached and to be trusted is for you know other veterans and people who have walked in the same shoes as them to, to, to approach them and build a relationship with them. Um, I, was, I was thinking that you're asking more also about the peer, meaning having literally like what we found is that team leaders are also peers and they listen to each other more than they listen to us. So we just create forums for them to listen to each other and they help each other. And so your point about peers is absolutely critical because the best way to influence behavior is through peers. You know, whether that's at the you know strict homelessness level or the team level or the community levels. And that's been widely researched as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Pepper Bates from the Connecticut Coalition and Homelessness. I have a, a very brief part today in just uh, really introducing David Rich, who will be the moderator of the panel on Bridgeport. And before I introduce David, uh, I was asked to just talk a little bit about why we're focusing on Bridgeport today. Uh, and the reason for that is a pretty, uh, pretty clear one. In a uh, very brief period, from 2012 to 2014, uh, a very creative experiment in the, uh, in the spirit as Nadine was talking about of experimenting, uh, a very creative experiment, uh, the Bridgeport Housing First Collaborative uh, had a great result. They decreased, according to their vulnerability index registry, they decreased chronic homelessness in Bridgeport by 50% in a two year period. And, And that made Bridgeport one of the top 14 performing communities across the nation in terms of reducing chronic homelessness according to the 100,000 Homes campaign. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. And as we sat together as a working group with Alicia and the partnership talking about how to bring together this session today, it seemed very natural to us to focus on one of our leaders in the state. Uh, but it's not to suggest that there is a template that we in Connecticut should seek to employ among all our communities. So we, we need to be clear about that. Every community in Connecticut, we're a small state, but a state of incredible differences from one end to, to the other, whichever direction you're going. Uh, so there's no one here who wants to suggest that there is a template or a cookie cutter that's going to resolve the issues of homelessness or end chronic homelessness in each community the same way. But rather, I think what we want to do is hear from our colleagues in Bridgeport about how they looked at their challenges as a community, how they looked at their assets as a community, 
Have they employed some of the strategies that Laura Zeilinger just spoke to us about, uh, including coordinating their efforts in a new way that's real collaboration, which as David has suggested means giving up some things as well as learning to do things differently, uh, and how they brought all that together uh, in their community, in their way, to achieve this incredible result. So that's why we're here to hear from Bridgeport. I'm going to uh, introduce David, and then David is going to introduce his panelists. Uh, David has been the Executive Director of Supportive Housing Works since 2006. And Supportive Housing Works is uh, an entity with membership from uh, their great uh, providers of services to the homelessness in the area of Fairfield County uh, and doing some work in New Haven County. Uh, most recently, David has been uh, a real lead on the creation of opening doors of Fairfield County, which in uh, the 2015 HUD cycle will be a merger of three COCs uh, to create a uh, bigger collaborative effort in Fairfield County. Uh, in his uh, experience and working with partners, he has uh, partnered on 22 developments with 725 units of affordable and permanent supportive housing. He has forged over 30 public-private partnerships to create 2,000 units of supportive housing throughout Connecticut. Uh, so David, if you would come up and introduce the rest of your panel. I'm glad we're going third here. So I think uh, Laura and Dean really did set the stage of where we need to go in Connecticut. In some ways, we're um, uh, sort of in, in, in a quandary where we've been so successful in Connecticut in planning and so successful in putting uh, and, and collaborating at a state level that we're sort of stuck a little bit. We're stuck in not really figuring out how to get to the end, how do we drive, drive towards zero. I think both Laura and Nadine really did sort of set the stage and, uh, and a discovery of what we need to do here, here in Connecticut. And I'll posit that that has to be based on communities. That's where the homeless are housed. That's where the vibrancy is. That's where the complexity is. That's where you can truly leverage resources at the community level. And so as Lisa said, what we have to do is give up a little bit. We've got to give up some of that control that we've created and nurtured here and that's been so successful here in Connecticut and really give that initiative, that innovation, that space to take risks and to collaborate to the communities, which is, which is hard, hard to do. It's hard for the state, from the state perspective, but it's also hard from the um, uh, community's uh, perspective to take that. And uh, as Lisa said, there's no really prescription, a uh, prescriptive model here. But I do think there are some tenets that we need to work on or every community needs. And I'll say, I'll posit that in any community, it does start with some leaders. You need some folks who are willing to take risks and, uh, and work, work together and to sort of put in suspension what they believed or what they did before, hold hands, say we're going to do this together. In Bridgeport, we've been very fortunate to have those leaders in Bridgeport for a long time, or longer than I've been in Bridgeport. I'm going to quickly introduce them, then we're going to see a short slide press or a video presentation and then hear more from the panelists. Mo Burke Schlesel, who's the uh, CEO of the United Way of Coastal Fairfield County. Carmen Cologne, who's the Executive Director of Alpha Community Services. Michael Cremelli, who's a local entrepreneur, developer, landlord in the greater Bridgeport area. Carla Nicholas, the Executive Director of Operation Hope. And Iris Santiago, who's the um, Director of Housing Choice Vouchers for the Bridgeport Housing Authority. Thank you all for being here today. <laughs> Where it all starts in, in Bridgeport uh, is knowing our customers, knowing the homeless. What we've done in Bridgeport for the last couple of years and now in Norwalk and in Stanford in April is start with rent treatment. One of the basic tenets of the 100,000 Homes campaign. And uh, in Bridgeport, we just um, had a registry week with, with using the BI school app a couple of weeks ago. And this was done by a local high school uh, student uh, as the registry week was taking place.
very important because it actually captures the most vulnerable population and that is the population that is most in need of our services and housing. It, it is the population that is at risk of dying out in our community. One, one gentleman was 21 and had been in foster care his whole life. Done just a few weeks ago, uh, approximately 80 chronic homeless in the Greater Bridgeport area. Our 100 day campaign, which we're starting April 1st, is to house the 40 most vulnerable, those that are need, uh, require permanent uh, supportive housing. And then our plan is to uh, house all by the end of this uh, year. But this is more than a 100 day campaign, it's really started over a thousand, uh, a thousand days ago. 
And as I said, it starts with, it starts with leadership. It can come from anywhere in a community. It just happened that in uh, Bridgeport, it came from Carmen Cuellen and Carlo Miklos, who uh, 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 had the inspiration, the vision to come together, put their resources, find the resources, and we're going to do something different. We're going to figure out how to end this fight in our region. So I'm turning this over to Carmen and Carlo. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. And thank you all for all the work that you do on behalf of the homeless population. And first and foremost, I want to thank our partners here, our collaborative, and David Rich, for his encouragement and encouraging every single one of us to be able to do this. Um, for many years, Carla and myself, myself as the Executive Director of Alpha Community Services under the YMCA, and Carla at Operation Hope, we competed for the same resources to take care of the same population. To take care of the same population across our entire state. Our homeless population that continue to go to her doors, continue to come to my doors, continue to need resources from the United Way, continue to need resources from our municipalities. And with all of that said, under the leadership of Rita Rich, we said that we need to join forces. But importantly, we needed to really join forces and truly believe in what we are doing. And it is important for all of us to believe in the work that we're doing and think about the mission. And Carla will attest to this. It hasn't been easy. It's hard work. But every day of our lives, when we look at the lives that we're saving, we say, this is worth it. And importantly is to know that it's not just Carla, myself, and the people that are sitting around this panel. It's that our entire staff has to believe in it. And that's not an easy task to undertake, because on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to continue to educate our staff to make sure that our staff understands that what we're doing is really important. And um, we could not do this work without the folks around here. Michael Cornelli, <coughs> such an important landlord that's out there, really a champion in our efforts, someone who believes in housing our population, the most vulnerable population, Alpha Community Service is saying we are putting our entire housing stock into housing the most vulnerable. Educating our property managers on a day-to-day -day basis, because there is turnover in property management companies, on a day-to-day -day basis, ensuring that they understand what the population looks like and understanding that this is what the owners want and understanding that this is what we must do. And I'll continue to speak as Right now, I'll turn it over to Car Carla to say some of exactly the work that we have been doing. So when we first started, you know, we had an idea that instead of working in silos, um, and we realized that the homeless in our community are traveling up and down the 95 corridor, and they're, they're starting in Greenwich, they're ending up in New Haven, and they pretty much, they stay a long time at Bridgeport. So what can we do about this? And, you know, we're all doing our own thing, and we're doing great work, all of us. And Carmen and I really, you know, the day is prodding, started thinking about how could we collaborate in a way that was a true collaboration, not a partnership, not an association, not a, a group of people with a common goal, but a group of people who were going to work together to solve a common goal. And the way we really started was by forming a collaborative team and hiring an independent team leader. This is actually here, Lisa Hudson. Thank you, Lisa. And not she, it wasn't an employee of Operation Hope. She wasn't an employee of Alpha Community Service or Haven Home Recovery, which is another one of our partners. But instead, we had her um, work under um, David as a supportive housing work staff person so that none of us could control the process or say that our culture had the right answers, but that we would build a collaborative culture. And one of the most important things to launching this effort was believing that we could build a common culture because our mission was to end homelessness in our community to identify people in need and to work together to make it happen. And, you know, Carmen and I have many similar philosophies, but we also had organizations that had some different philosophies. And we had to put those things aside and agree that together we were going to be able to solve problems. Together we'd be a lot stronger. And, you know, I am proud to sit here today to say that it worked very well. We needed a lot of other help. You'll hear about those things. But the major turning point was that we believed that we could do that. And we could inspire our staffs to form a common culture across different organizations. And it was pretty powerful. And I think 
the vulnerability index did a lot for us to, to say, okay, we all know these people, we recognize these are the people we're serving, and together we can do something about it. But it takes leadership, and it takes um, real determination, and um, persistence, and belief, even when it doesn't seem possible. So I thank you, Donna, for working with me. I thank you. One of the things that we also want to make sure that we highlight is the fact that as stakeholders, we have developed great relationships, working relationships within our municipalities. And the line of work that we do, we have to make sure that our reputation is the best reputation out there in ensuring that we are taking care of the homeless population. And the city of Bridgeport and in Fairfield, our local leaders, meaning our elected officials, respect our work. And importantly, they will fight to ensure that we are getting the resources coming into our municipalities the way that they need to happen. And that's because we have taken the time to educate them as well. Therefore, I would encourage everyone to make sure that your local leaders, your elected, know exactly about the work that you do. It is their business to ensure that the population, our current homeless population, is served. And they will be there by your side to champion that effort. But again, it is all in education. And when we sit around the table and we go to our local leaders, we're there together, one voice on behalf of this population. And if I could just quickly piggyback on that, it's also your funders. One of the most important things that um, we realized quickly was if we were really going to solve this problem, we couldn't use <coughs> a perfect model or um, a large amount of money that was going to pour into our community to solve the problem. So we had to do a lot of leveraging of existing resources. And that meant re-educating our funders that you know we're funded to do this, but we'd also like to do this with the money. We're still going to do what you've asked us to do, but we'd like to leverage that position and leverage that funding in another way. Um, it included both Carmen and I put up um, any available units in our supportive housing portfolio. We shared staff that was covered by many different grants and funders. Um, but it was really important for us to, to recognize the value in educating our funders as well as our elected officials in order to make it happen. Because it's not like there's any extra money out there. So what we had to do was be extremely creative with what we had so that we could demonstrate that this was a project that was worth funding. And I think that was a real change in orientation too that um, we just had to know so I'd write it and make sure that that happened. I would add that the mainstream resources, there are, there's still a lot of work that we need to do in our community around that area. But there are many, many of those service providers out there that have come to the table and continue to come to the table. But it's not over. We have to continue to make sure that those mainstream resources are coming to our table and that we're educating them as well. And we're saving, uh, serving as IT support for them because a lot of folks don't have the, that capacity. And we should, not that we have all the capacity in the world, <laughs> but we do share the resources that we have to make it a lot simpler for folks who come to the table and again take care of the population that we're serving. And I know that you know, there's other people on the panel that you'll hear from, so please ask us questions after. But um, I wanted to point out something. The, the video that you just saw was from the second um, registry week that we did, but about a year and a half ago when we did our first registry week, and that's what really helped us kick off our, um, our focus. And um, Grace talked that, about our 50% um, reduction in homelessness that we're very proud of. But, put that in perspective for you, I just wanted to give you a couple of quick numbers. Um, when we did the vulnerability index the first time, we were able to complete that um, survey, which if any of you have ever done it, you know it's very comprehensive. So we went out in the early mornings, late evenings, and we were able to speak to just under 300 people um, who were willing to complete the entire survey and allow us to take their picture and put them on the register. And the picture was really important so that across the region we would be able to identify people when we had a unit or a bed. Um, but we're really proud to be part of the 100,000 Homes Campaign's 2.5% club. And that club is an elite group of um, cities and organizations across the country who have been able to house at least 2% or 2.5% of the people on their registry every month from when they do their registry. We have been able to house at least 6.5% every month. And the reason we're able to do that is A lot to do with our, our amazing continuum of care and our support across the board and our staff and our leadership and people we work with, but also at least the people who are sitting either side of me. So um, you're going to hear from them in a minute, but we're really proud of that. And it, it hasn't wavered, so we've never dipped below that so far, and that's 18 months. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Carmen.
Uh, Laura talked about leveraging community resources. We all talk about that. And uh, we sort of let that slip and then we move on to where we're going to get more money uh, from the state or the federal government or from our local, local governments. I really do, and we all really do believe it's got to start with those mainstream resources. You've got to take that seriously. Bridgeport is one of the poorest cities in the nation. It doesn't, it's not well here for the county, because Bridgeport is, is not. Uh, in the last four or five years, we've had some additional money here at the state level, largely for building permanent supportive housing. But as we know, that takes three, four, five, six years. We have to end chronic homelessness in the next two or three years. Federal government has been great keeping the money there, but it's not a great amount of additional money. It's got to start by looking at whatever assets are in the community and really being innovative and creative with those assets you currently have. They can come from anywhere. And that's, I think, one of the real gems of the 100-day campaign. There really is asset base at the community level. Really looking at what you have instead of what you hope you, hope you have. One thing we were blessed with in Bridgeport was the Bridgeport Housing Authority in Artemis, uh, Santiago. And uh, they didn't have uh, additional resources, but they did have turnovers and resources. They did have 2,000 units, roughly 100 turnovers a year. So it was being able to tap into those resources, which Iris would talk about. It's easy for me to take risks. I get paid to do that. Someone like Iris, who works for a government bureaucracy, is not. That's the last thing bureaucrats are going to want to do. And that's why I admire Iris so much. She took those risks. She didn't have to take those risks. She really pushed the envelope of what was possible in, uh, with her housing authority, took the risks on us as a community and what we could do, and, and kept learning with us. And we made some doozies and mistakes as we went along, housing the wrong people. And there were not those that were most vulnerable. And uh, it took years of work with her and with her, with her team. But I'm going to hand it over to Iris and just really talk about that whole process of working with the community. Thanks, Iris. And if you could all speak into the mics. I didn't want that little thing when you want to release or something and then walk out and figure it out. <laughs> um, and to me, it is a great nice place to be here and be part of the team. Um, and David is such an inspiration. And he came to my office and said, Iris, do you need to find a way to help us? How to be homeless, but the funding wasn't there. Um, so it was just important to use the resources that the housing authority had. You know, we have over 2,800 vouchers, um, and we have the ability to house people. We also have the ability to work with our wait list. Because as you know, the government is very, you know, you have to do eligibility, you have to do preferences on the wait list. Um, so that was one of the things I committed with David was to change our administrative plan and have a preference for the homeless individuals to get house for us. So that was one of the first things that we did. Um, and then the other thing that we did was we have currently 310 project-based vouchers, and they come along with supportive services for the homeless. So, you know, that comes with a lot of work in putting out the crack RFP out there to attract those owners and developers to um, buy into housing the homeless. And some of the benefits of participating with the housing authority as well. So it was like, you could get the funding, but it would take so long sometimes to develop those houses. So we reached out to current homeowners on the program and also for any existing units for these um, homeless individuals. And we committed that we would do 125 vouchers for the homeless in three years. And it's been a year and a half. And we have finished almost just about half. Um, so I'm glad that um, the housing authority was played a big role in that. In, that in housing, um, we thought it was going to be a high turnover. And it turned out not to be. Turned out not to be, of course, at the beginning, especially with Mike being the first guinea pig, as he said. Well, um, he was so willing and actually said, you know what, we can do this. And there were a lot of mistakes um, along the way. But we all learned to work together because, you know, everybody has a goal. Everybody has different personality. You know, and I look at the time thing, you know, oh, I'm glad the whole is not my side. You know, and then we had to say, you know what, we're in it together. And it doesn't matter who did this or who did that, let's just fix it and keep it going. 
And so um, we try to streamline the people that we also manage to put in our administrative plan is to have referrals. So they find the clients out there, they screen them, they do the referrals, they go through getting the birth certificates, the social security, their income. So that makes our job a lot easier. A lot of the times we don't even see the individuals coming to our office. They have their files, they bring them in, we do the screening, we do the criminal. So it's important that you build a relationship with your housing authority. Find out what your community needs, what the services um, are, and then ask for the ED or the director of the housing authority to change the administrative plan. So that's important for you to be. It's a lot of regulations, a lot of rules. However, if you take the time out to be, there are flexibilities, and you just have to find a way. With the ministry of plans, you can change them yearly, you can change them in the three months. So there is that flexibility, and just get the HUD office from micro very um, instrumental and accepting what we put in place as policy. You know, and again, I cannot stress the importance of privacy. Housing authorities are allowed to use 20% of their funding allocation for the project base. And a lot of housing authorities don't exercise that. And when you put that RFP, be very clear as to what your scope of work is and what it is that you want for your community. Um, and as far as developers, it is an advantage for you to take that half or a half contract and say, you know what, I'm going to be getting a 15-year contract which is the initial contract, and there is subsidy that's going to be coming in. The rental's going to be here to pay off this mortgage. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of benefits to having developers involved with project base. Um, and again, the um, interesting thing is that in HUD's policy or your regs, you know, they were very stringent about what preferences are and what the homeowners had the ability, or I'm sorry, the developers or project based owners have the ability to put in their own preferences. And there is a PIG notice out there that does give each owner their option to do their own wait list and also to put in their preferences. So their ability to hold the homelessness is there. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Uh, I know a lot of you have been thinking, well, we don't have a housing authority like the Bridgeport Housing Authority. How do we make this work? True, true. Uh, I'm going to give a little example in Norwalk. We had a housing authority, and man, I was just beating my head on. I just couldn't get them to do anything for years. And, uh, and uh, the people with far more patients than I they kept on working with the Norwalk Housing Authority. Folks from, from, from Norwalk. And uh, they got the Norwalk Housing Authority to finally come along. Not 150, 170, but starting with five, five, five minutes. And then I was thinking, oh, I'm never going to waive their, their requirements. Just last week, they did. And they said they would work with most of them. They came right off the, uh, uh, right off, uh, uh, right off the list. And those that do have drug addictions uh, do have criminal backgrounds. So housing authorities can change. It just takes the constant nurturing and work on working with them. I think it's also important to know that's not the only thing. In normal, we kept racking the we've got to get more for, we've got to get more sex needs. There was something else staring at us we didn't even think about until three weeks ago. There was a busted transitional uh, housing development working with a cap agency that's struggling. 50% uh, uh, vacancy for 24 unit uh, developments. Right there off the bat, 12 vacancies. They have a turnover of 30, 40% a year. So in the next year, year and a half, there are going to be 24 units that we could use. Went and talked to the cap agency and said, we'd love to work with you. And we're all got together the service providers to provide the services. Uh, we went and talked to DOH, that was now the funder of these units, and they said, yeah, we'll work with you to turn this transition into permanent supportive housing. So voila, in 10 days, we able to create 24 units of permanent supportive housing right off the BI. And uh, so it takes communities to really look at everything you can to get, uh, get this job done. Landlords are critical to make this work, and uh, learned that more and more over the years. Michael McNally is one that uh, uh, as, as Iris said, started working with us from the very beginning. One of her earliest epiphanies is that we don't have to develop all these units ourselves. We've got the private sector out there, we've got the nonprofits developing these units. Why can't we just use those units? A place like Bridgeport, it's 100% of the developments over eight, eight units do have set aside for homes. It's not mandatory. We've created incentives, we've asked them. They see it's in their self self interest. So we have, I wouldn't say too many units. 
we have enough units. And that's not really the stumbling block in what we work with. Having good landlords to work with, we get it. And we need to work with this day in and day out is a critical piece to this. And not regarding not just the permanent support of housing. It's as important as we're using rapid rehousing for many of these homeless. For the homeless through the VIs to that, we say they don't need any community resources from us. They just need community resources. They have to be housed also. The whole continuum of housing, you have to have those relationships with, with landlords. Those landlords are out there. In Fairfield County, uh, there's over 1,000 units, rental units, 7% vacancy. That's close to seven or 8,000 vacant units at any one time. We just have to find a mere a small fraction of those with landlords willing to work with us. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael to talk about his process and the hiccups that he faced working with us. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, good morning. I, I, uh, once all of this collaborative approach was put together, uh, I was approached to just ask, hey, do you think you could you know, put together about 40 units of housing in a few months uh, you know, across a lot of, in Bridgeport we have a lot of smaller units of two or four or two, five or six units. And so they're, they're, uh, uh, you know, there's not many large, larger uh, uh, or, or properties. So, so I said, okay, and, uh, and they said the one thing that they could, uh, that they were bringing to the table, which, which was a, a good thing, is, is the project-based vouchers that I mentioned would, would be a, a guaranteed rent stream for your, for your properties. Uh, so that's, that's a, an attractive you know, uh, asset to, to start with. Uh, but then from there they said, but you know, could you just buy a, you know, a couple million dollars of cash lying around and just go buy properties really fast? And then, by the way, can you also do that while you don't really have a permanent financing take out of the place and, and, and just have a hope that eventually things will work out? And so, uh, just dived in and just gave it a shot. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time convincing land, um, lenders and uh, private lenders and private investors and, and you know, people to try and say that you know, this, is, this was going to work out okay. And, and by the way, we also had to rehabilitate all these units within that four or five or six month period as well. So, uh, so we were able to get buy-in from, from private investment. We were, we were able to get buy-in from, from uh, you know, private uh, mortgage side to, to cover the short term construction period and pre-development funding side where you're running around putting down deposits and doing reports and et cetera. And then uh, we found a really great partner in the housing development fund who uh, really, really you know, understood what we're doing and was willing to work with a whole bunch of small properties and combine them to, to a couple of uh, larger, uh, longer term mortgages. And uh, so, so that was the first part of it. And, and then, you know, then the second part was once you have these properties finished and once you have these properties ready to go, uh, then you know, you've got to go through this lease up process and, and, and you know, work, work with, uh, you know, first you know, figure out who, where the tenants are, are going to be coming from and, and make sure we follow all the procedures and rules and, and regulations. And that's been a learning process over the last couple of years. But I have to say it's been like an absolute pleasure to work with everyone on the team. And, uh, and, and I think that, our, as I said, we, we have you know, worked <coughs> to the point where we have a really good rhythm at this point in time. And, uh, and that's, and that's you know, been, uh, been uh, made it a lot easier. And so now I feel like we have a good uh, system going there, number one. And then number two is that we finally get a chance to actually meet a lot of the tenants because as we manage the, the units and, and see the you know, sort of people as they come in. Uh, we spend a lot of time helping people get into those units. You know, a lot of times people come out of shelters with a bag of clothes, or if not, not even a bag. And, and, uh, so we try to like, you know, do a little something extra to try and figure out those little extra things that people could use. I mean, a lot of times it's as simple as, you know, some towels, some toothpaste, toothbrushes, and things that, you know, they, they're not going to have a few hundred dollars to, to go get started on. And a lot of times we have to work out issues with security deposits, and, you know, sometimes there's Deposit guarantees. Sometimes there's a little bit of fun. Sometimes there's nothing. So we make little plans, you know, to, to just do something over the, over the long term. And uh, so we tried to work out a lot of those, those issues. And uh, uh, but so far as of, as of right now, we're, we're all of our units, I think except for one, are, are all rented out, and all the tenants are in there. And, uh, and uh, that's what we're doing. So thank you. Giving a lot of credit because that one person has to take more credit than anyone else. It really does take a funder to help lead this. 
and the community level, we didn't really have that. We were on our, on our, on our own. And it came from, I, I thought, a very unusual place. But it is a traditionally very conservative funding source in that way. They have to. Merle got it right from the start. She took that risk on this community before anyone else did. Before we really had the concept of what we're going to do. The belief in us coming together, holding hands, and put a hell of a lot of resources in this from day one. For Rafferty Housing and for the backbone organization for services for uh, fixing up these, these units. And uh, I love this United Way. And uh, I think every community needs at least one funder who gets it, who's willing to hold hands to make it to make it happen. And we request for that in Bridgeport and in Kowalk for the Roman United Way of Coastal Heritage County. We're going to talk for a few minutes about um, how she got into this, then a little bit about um, what we haven't talked about, is our model of collective impact, and how we work together uh, throughout Bridgeport and now throughout uh, Coastal Fairfield County, bringing in Norwalk and Sanford, which are also conducting their VI Cadets and Hunt Day campaign. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Well, um, David, we love you. Our United Way loves you. Um, we love the community. We love the Because this collaborative delivers results. And our donors are interested in results and improving the human condition. It's that simple. Uh, we take a very broad view at our United Way. I've been here for 13 years, and we've been doing funding to end homelessness for uh, actually maybe the 11. We initially funded the 10 year plan on homelessness, and then that created uh, the Supportive Housing Works uh, Institution, which really is what we call the backbone institution to bring things together which then spawned all the incredible activity uh, you've heard about, which again leads to results. So we're a venture capitalist in a way. Um, we are able to invest freely uh, across regions. We don't have the constraints of municipalities. We don't have the constraints of, of federal uh, in, uh, institutions or state institutions. So we can take a risk where others can't necessarily take a risk. But if we don't see results quickly and, you know, the, the rapid piece was an important piece to hear about. If we don't see results, uh, donors do not stay for a long time until they start to see results. But when you begin to fund uh, an initiative such as this, uh, it's about collaboration, and that is a shop-worn term. You know, if we continue to hear about collaboration and collective impact, I've had enough myself. But when you see it, and I've, I've had my own working definition of collaboration, an unnatural act between non-consenting adults. <laughs> and it's here. You know, it's not easy to give up. So, you know, I'm watching you know, Carmen and Carla, who represent their own shops with their own boards of directors and their own donors. And they're back and forth. You know, they are in partnership and they are in deep collaboration. And it is because they keep their eye, as everyone here does, on solving the problem. And it's about solving the problem. And that's what the, the whole collective impact there is. So actually, um, a little bit about you know why we got into this business and why I encourage you to speak to the United Way in your community or a foundation or, or some institution that's got a broad interest. I have felt um, that homelessness is a proxy for the health of the entire community. When at our United Way we were looking to see where we should invest and what makes the most sense, if you've got a huge homelessness problem. You have got an enormous system failure. I believe that homelessness is a catastrophic system failure. And if we can solve homelessness, we can solve for much bigger problems. So I'm here to ask you to take yet the next step, as uh, David knows I always do, uh, to prompt you as system leaders, because I, I, I liken you to sort of the goalies on the field by the time people are homelessness, and it's you know it's a small number in terms of the, the whole population, but by the time people make it into homelessness, which is not where you want to be, they have gone through an enormous number of systems. So you, of all people, I believe, understand the complexity of the systems and how systems need to work together. And as you're doing school now and doing this rapidly and creating drama, I think that you are the best situated people in your various communities to not only end homelessness, but to build broader collaborations. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm sitting with people who actually came into my office and said, girl, 
we are doing a good problem of managing chronic homelessness. We will end chronic homelessness, but there are so many other systems. What can we do? So leadership has emerged uh, in the Bridgeport community to, to broaden the collective impact work that we're doing to include the health providers, to include the mental health providers, to include the school systems, because those systems have failed your clients, and you know where the issues are that there can be correction. So the challenge is um, keep on doing what you're doing, because you will be ending chronic homelessness very, very soon. But take your position in leadership because of your incredible understanding of the system to help us improve other systems to improve the community conditions. So that's um, the next challenge, and I hope we have the opportunity to talk about it um, a year from now, because I really think that you are the folks who can provide um, that leadership. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity to confirm what I think is the edge of what we can identify in communities to improve communities totally and reform systems Thank you, Mel. And just about 30 seconds left, and then we'll open question and answers. I, I actually I don't want you all think it's just these five who made this happen. Uh, they were the ones who instigated this and started it. But it really does take a, a village to make this uh, to make this work. And on the 100 day campaign we're working on right now, uh, uh, in veteran homelessness, and to house all those that are in and requiring permanent support and housing, it does take the whole community. So it's every service provider is involved. And getting from from the recovery from the early beginning. Uh, uh, Orbrook was involved. The, the faith-based community is critical, critical, and then CCH is critical. It's just everyone, it's all hands on deck. And that's, that's, that's the remarkable beauty of this, and that's the excitement of seeing people come in and say, we're going to change these rules, we're going to get this done, and that's why I'm thrilled to be a part, a part of this. Thank you very much. affected your turnover and your ability to continue to rent out those turnover units for your um, vouchers. And then the other one is for Merle, what did you fund for your rent? This services to, to keep those people housed and not have them end up back on the street and who's doing that work or where's so, that been? Right, so that's why Carmen and I are sitting here and we're talking about our collaboration. Um, we're providing the social services, the case management, the screening, the follow-up, the um, we're using evidence-based practices. We're taking this very seriously. All of us who are part of the collaboration um, run homeless shelters, affordable housing programs, supportive housing programs. So we're experts in our community. And so. What we did was, when I talked about our staff, and Carmen mentioned our staff, we donated MSWs and paraprofessional case managers to this team, and they work with all the clients that we've housed. So it starts out with screening. We actually, um, uh, about what, two years ago, we got a SAMHSA grant to help start funding some of this. So that sort of ratcheted up the evaluation piece, the data tracking piece. But we're using a CTI model. Initially, it's intensive case management. Um, for people who still need the permanent supportive housing, what we've basically done is use Michael's units and Iris's vouchers to create more permanent supportive affordable housing in the community. We're providing the support, they're providing the housing. 
So um, we're, we're doing lots of creative things to, to make sure that we're supporting people in need. We're not, it's not just housing first and we walk away. It's housing first, wraparound services. And when we were talking about mainstream, what we mean is that it takes the entire community to stabilize people. So it's not just our case managers who are doing work, but we're connecting them to as many mainstream resources in our community as possible, making sure that those community resources buy into what we're doing, recognize the value in what we're doing, and recognize their obligation to take care of these people. And so that's really a big system shift, I think, in our community. We're still working on that. That's not the easy piece. And you're funded from where? Those four well, when I talk about leveraging, a piece of it is, for example, I have a case manager who's funded through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. She's funded to serve X number of people in my permanent supportive housing. We made a commitment that we would double her caseload with the same amount of money so that she could work on this team. That's not ideal, most people would shy away from that, but we are so committed to doing this work and we wanted so desperately to prove that it was valuable that we made those types of leveraging agreements and that's how we've done it. We also, both of us, use private funding to fund some of this. So it's, it's complicated. And then SAMHSA came in and funded a position or two, um, which helped a little bit also. We also make sure that the most vulnerable are housed in our supportive housing units where we have more case management staff. So that level of who needs the most services goes into those students. Therefore, the initial intake and assessment is really important to the process. And both of us have made a commitment that if people go through, let's say, CTI, which does have a, dis a discharge component to the community and, and mainstream resources are supposed to kick in, any time that a client needs help again, they can come right back through the system and our case managers are available to them. So we, we're doing a great <coughs> network and really a big network of support for Piece here, which we haven't really addressed, is that we talk about feeling what we've done. This doesn't happen in isolation. It's with our work with our state agencies that make it happen, with the partnership, with CCA, with, with HUD, with Corporation Support of Housing, uh, with the Melvins, with everyone else here. And, uh, and that the dialogue is critical. So it wasn't just saying we're going to do this. It's talking to Demas and saying, hey, can we be creative here? Can we make this happen? Talking to HUD and saying, hey, can we sure to change our, our or prioritization, and uh, and so it's it's taking every this wonderful wonderful work that's happened in Connecticut over the last 10, 15 years, and then how to take that and just take it down to the community level to make it work at the community level. So it's certainly not working in a vacuum, and it's really good work for all of you that's made it uh, possible in Bridgeport, and I think in all the communities throughout Connecticut. Okay, ditto. Um, to David and his leadership here in Connecticut, and to all of you on the panel, a lot of insight. Um, Lisa next to me, she keeps asking me for more ideas, so we'll work on that. <laughs> but um, I wanted to suggest there is a program in Massachusetts, and I know Betsy heard about it when I spoke up there, called New Leaf, in which the um, private owners of HUD-supported housing have put up their units working with HUD on the preference issue. It's an experiment, I mean a demonstration for 200 units a year for two years. It's for families, have families that are homeless coming off the state's emergency assistance list. So there have already been some screening and some connection to supportive services. So it's something to look at. I know that USICH is looking at it. I know that the Secretary of HUD got to hear firsthand from some of the different partners, the state, um, uh, the different uh, partners at the level and, and the developers. But thank you for stepping up because we do need the resources that the private sector has. So my sort of comment and question then would be to Merle because I do think United Ways can lead the way. I think the thing that philanthropy can do is to stay the course. So um, I, I'm hoping that your board members and those who've made this investment will do that. So it's sort of a comment and a question because this situation developed over many years and while we have the benchmarks which Laura has outlined, David's talked about all of you and we're making great progress, my belief it will take a number of years so I'm hoping that uh, this United Way will stay the course with these organizations and uh, partners. Well, I can say, I think it was two months ago, David, you were at my board meeting, so David's a regular. <laughs> uh, and very important to do that, because uh, we share the good work and the good news um, with the board regularly. And the, the big message is the entire community benefits from the work that's being done. And just to share how we got into this, uh, to convince my board, Ten years ago, um, it's a it's a corporate group who uh, do not necessarily think the way you think. Um, but when we told the million dollar Murray story that all of you know, and when the uh, corporations realized that it was not a good thing economically, um, so David comes back.
staff to refresh us and let us know the remarkable reduction and the cost savings to the community. And it's all good, it's a good news report um, every every now and then. We plan to, to stay the course, but again, the challenge is we've got to go broader. I really think that the capacity is here to go even broader, to lead the way for more system change, because I think you are system thinkers. Again, I don't want to beat you up, but I'm not beat you up. I'm saying go for it, because that is something we would invest in even more. You are big system thinkers, and I think that you can lead the way in, in creating more system change and community. Just add a little piece to that, because Marlon knows um, that collective impact, when we think about our school systems, our building school systems, this is a model that actually can be taken and replicated and ensuring that we are closing that achievement gap. And I have spoken uh, to Merle's board in exactly that. When I look at the numbers of the Housing Authority, uh, the number of school aged children was some, some, somewhere in the vicinity of 4,000 children are housed at our local public housing authority. We have a captive audience. We can really make a difference. And therefore, those numbers will bring them back to those boards and say, this is systems change. We can do this. We can take this model and replicate it, and our world is going to be a better place. I want to thank the entire panel, and David, and all of our speakers today. Um, all the materials from today's event will be on our website under our iForums link. So we'll also put a link to the video. I apologize the issue that arose with the sound. I don't see if here. If you want to go back and take a look at that, it will be on the website. And for those of you who are registered um, for our focus lunch session, that will be across the hall. Um, and for everyone else, thank you to the audience for the wonderful questions and again to all of our speakers. Bye -bye.